you actually have to be on cocaine to be on this podcast. It's a great day to be a Wildcat! What's up, everybody? You're listening to yet another edition of Cocaine Willie. I am your commissioner, Bob Trollsby, and as always, I'm joined by my two co-hosts, the good chef, Andre Napier, and Fireball Matt Marchesini. Tonight, again, the Cats are coming off of a massive victory. We're not going to talk about that, though. We are going to talk about the matchup against the Kansas Jayhawks in what will be the 121st edition of the Sunflower Showdown. Guys, I, I guess just to get it kicked off here, we're playing a pretty good KU team, but they don't have a quarterback. <laughs> that we, that I mean, we don't know who's playing quarterback. I mean, when people are listening to this, we don't know if it's going to be Jason Bean, if he's going to be healthy or not, or if it's going to be Cole Ballard, whatever his name is, the third string preferred walk-on who's, who's playing for KU. And Jalen Daniels has back tightness because he can't find a mattress that's good enough for him. Uh, without exacerbating an injury that maybe it goes back to last season. I don't know. But how are we feeling about this matchup against KU this weekend and in, in what will be probably the two highest ranked KU and K-State teams since 1995 going into a matchup together? I'll let Chef go before I negative Nancy this whole thing. <laughs> I'm, Great. I'm, I'm feeling Getting off to a strong start. <laughs> I'm feeling very positive. You know, I think – I think this matchup suits us well. I think we're coming into our own. I think we found a lot of things uh, coming out of that Texas loss. And then this Baylor win, I think we've seen this team grow and do some things that, you know, we hadn't done all year. A defensive score, a non-offensive touchdown. Absolutely huge. I think now we're, are we road tested versus decent teams? That's the one question that we have. It being in the state of Kansas, not that far of a road trip, I think Kansas State fans are going to show up um, pretty strong. So I'm not nervous at all for this game. Um, the quarterback situation does throw a wrench into it. You know, uh, you could go into this game feeling, you know, moderately okay to absolutely having all the confidence in the world. So <laughs> I was nervous for Baylor and I was had my, you know, you know, I had my hesitancies with that Baylor game being 95% favorites. Uh, so I'm, I'm on top of the world right now. KU's going down. Oh my God. Here it comes everybody. All right. We have not played a decent team on the road and won this season. We have not. This is a rivalry game. This is the best, one of the best teams KU has had in 15 years, whatever. The thing that I struggle with about this game is it's for me, it is obvious that K-State is the better team right now. Um, you could say that with Jason Bean at quarterback or Cole Ballard at quarterback, but going on the road and it being a rivalry game. And both fan bases are going to be amped up for this game. There's no question about it. It doesn't matter who KU is going to trot out there at quarterback. But we have not played well on the road except for one game in that Texas Tech game. And we took their quarterback out. And that was very helpful. So I, I just had – I have some – just – I have some doubts that – this is not going to be like a game that we've seen the past 15 years. I just, I, I do feel that way. Um, you'll hear my prediction in a little bit, but this team is going to prepare. Uh, they've always come up for this game uh, with Chris Kleiman as the head coach. Um, obviously with Bill as the head coach, this team is always ready for this game. I will also say that from a KU perspective, this is the best team that we're going to see from them in a long time. And we cannot 
as a fan base go in there and think we're going to win by 30 points, let alone 14. I think this is going to be a really close game. And it's just because you may have a KU team that's going to play up to their competition. You have a K-State team that even though it's Kansas as a rival, we have yet to prove that we can win and execute in all four quarters on a game on the road. Haven't shown it this year. I would love to see it happen this Saturday. I really would. I think it's going to be a lot closer than people think. Um, there's, there's just some factors at play here that make me feel that way at this point. How big of a difference do you think it makes that it's in the state of Kansas versus Texas or Oklahoma or Missouri? I personally, I, I think any game on the road, it could be in the state of Kansas, but this is also not going to be a situation where, I mean, how big did the stadium? Is it 50,000, 60,000? I mean, well, they decreased the capacity officially from 50,000 to 47,000. So it'll be a sellout with, you know, 50,000 people, but technically their capacity is 47,000. But uh, historic, like in recent history, when we play in Lawrence, we bring a huge crowd there and we get a lot of K-State fans there that get tickets late because KU isn't doing well and you can get tickets at high V. But this is a different, this is just different. I think it's going to be a little bit more of a road environment than they've seen in Lawrence. And I'm not saying K-State fans aren't going to be there and not going to be loud, but it's. It, I, I do feel the environment is going to be a little bit different than what we've seen there. And you're going to put it on par with, I'm not going to say Missouri, um, but it, it's going to be on, like, this is a huge game for them as well as a huge game for us. I mean, if we look at the grand scheme of things, so. I, I, I just look, I think it's going to truly be a road environment for this game um, with some more K-State fans. Yes. Okay. So hold on. Let me get this straight. You're, you're, you're worried about the road environment at Memorial Stadium when we played Texas. Our, I mean, in front of 100,000. That team was not rattled in front of 100,000. Mind you, we played like dog shit at the beginning of the game, but... I don't think this is I don't think this is the environment that you're going to say that would make you nervous to the point where it's going to alter the game. But that that bolsters Matt's point because he said this team has not played a complete full four quarters on the road this entire season. And we don't start off well on the road and we don't sustain like you we, we look at the start of these games and I I mean, yes, you could say that the Missouri environment was difficult in Texas and like all the, it they have not played four full quarters where they have been executing and on the offensive side, defensive side, whatever on the road. I, I would say haven't. Texas. I would say Texas Tech. We played a full four quarters. But the I mean the start the of that first game. Half was sus. The first half was sus. I, was it? I mean, it, it was the one score game and in going into halftime. But we knew that game was going to be a little bit of a challenge. It's not like we we're going into any road environment saying that we're going to dog walk anybody. No, I I mean I think the Texas oh, Tech game at Oklahoma the time State at that point in the season. <laughs> I mean, we did, Texas, yes. you the guys Texas did. Game, <laughs> the Texas Tech game we were coming off of a awful ass loss, and yes, this team at that time had showed nothing to say that they would be able to beat a Texas Tech team on the road, but you have, I mean, Will oh. Howard did not play well early in that game. You bring in Avery and I mean, Will, he had one drive down the field to score the touchdown in the beginning of the game, but that game at the half was a one score game. We were winning by three points against a, a supposedly the dark horse team of the big 12. That's this season on the road by three points at halftime. And then we brought out the secret weapon. Which so, in retrospect I, we've learned had means nothing. The dark horse dad, they might not even, they might not even make a bowl game. I, I understand that, but this team that you're you're just you just said that was barely scratching for a bowl game just went into Lawrence and you know beat the shit. Well, not there. beat the shit, but they beat there. a Lawrence Jayhawk team that you're you're talking about right now. With the quarterback that we took out of the game in the second half, and they played a true freshman at quarterback. This is my point from my side is this. KU is a team that has talent on both sides of the football. And yes, I would say that K-State is the better football team right now. Mm -hmm. But 
We have not shown on the road this season to play a full game where we have executed. And no matter if this environment ends up being 20,000 K-State fans there, it won't be, but I, they have to prove that before I can be here and saying, yeah, this team's like there. I, I just, that is how I feel about this game. And I'll, who knows, I may be 100% dead wrong, and I hope I am on Saturday night. But that's my worry. I, I That truly is my worry. The, you have two games left. You have this game on the road. The ro- We have played well on the road in those games, mind you, but we don't execute to get the victory. And that is where my mind is going on this one. Does that worry change for you regardless of who's at quarterback for KU or does it change based on who's at quarterback for KU? Oh, hundred percent. I, if we're playing Cole Ballard, my, this changes. Throw it out the window. <laughs> but that's what, I mean, I'm hearing, like we're hearing that Jason Bean wants to play on Saturday. Now we may not know, and this is probably like, if we were in the same situation we're not going to say anything until Saturday, like KU is probably going to be in that situation. So you're preparing for both quarterbacks playing against a true, you know, a a freshman quarterback. We have shown this season on the defensive side of the football to scheme against that, get that quarterback to make mistakes and win those games. So yes, my worry does change. That's incredibly that I'm saying that I'm putting so much stock in Jason Bean that it changes that dynamic. But again, I, I have felt this since, I felt this for a while now that this game was going to be one that it's going to be close and K state, albeit they're just kind of on a tear right now. And this may be a worry that is just not withstanding at all, but they have not shown a full four quarters on the road this season. And so my mindset is they're not going to do it for the last road game of the season. I I totally disagree, and I mean it's just this KU team is talented at certain spots, but in terms of the matchup that we're bring the Kansas State Wildcats are bringing to Lawrence, I don't think they match up particularly well. You know, Will Howard has established himself as the commander in chief of this team. He's He's reached pinnacles that, you know, not a lot of people thought he would get to. He's the all-time leading passing touchdown leader at Kansas State history. Kind of nuts for you to throw Will Howard's name in that sentence. and But it's, it's deservingly so. And he's, he's peaking at the right time. KU, on the other hand, you know, quarterback drama, quarterback injury. And defensively, we've we've come to realize that they're they're not great against the run. DJ Gins is peaking. Our offensive line is peaked. Uh, so I just think it's and defensively, we're you know they have two good running backs that could pose problems. And if I was them, and it was a quarterback situation where would I would have to start a walk on freshman, I would honestly think about putting. A wildcat quarterback, basically the entire game. A, a wildcat running back. Sorry. I, I'm, I'm, I thought I was on mute this whole time. God damn it! I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You're I'm not, laughing. You're not on mute. I was not on mute. That's my bad. Look, I, if it gets to that point, then my worries off the table. I, no I mean, worry. when's the last the last time somebody ran out a running back at? you know, wildcat quarterback for the entire game, what happened? Uh, the 49ers against the Eagles, and they lost in the NFC. That was bad. <laughs> that was bad. Because Brock Purdy, of all people, rookie, rookie quarterback. And I mean, no, whatever he to... was, where he, was, he couldn't throw. I'm thinking more two years ago, Texas versus us, and, you know, they just dropped Roshan back there and just said, hey, let's run the ball versus K-State, and it led to a K-State loss. So Throw back to when we had Deuce out of the Wildcat in that game, too. That was a strange decision that was made. But that was certainly a choice. That was so certainly a choice. What What about other than the road environment? Because there is a road environment that we've played in many times, and guys on this team have played in a number of times at this point, you know, so there are probably some guys on this team who 
there, there are guys on this team who have played at David Booth Memorial Stadium twice now. You've got guys like Philip Brooks, but Cooper Beebe, who have who have played there twice, three times. I know Phil, Philip Brooks. Philip Brooks has definitely played there three times. Nineteen, twenty-one, and twenty. No, nineteen. This will be this will be his. This will be his third. But what I'm okay, saying okay. is they've, yeah. they've played there twice, twice already. Yeah. This will be their third saying, time. Yeah. Thank you for clarifying. Um, what have you noticed about KU specifically going into this matchup that scares you? What advantages do you think they have against K State in this matchup this weekend? Whoever wants uh, to go first can go first, but I would say the rushing game personally. Yeah, I mean, I think from the offensive side of the football, they they've obviously done a great job in scheming against their opponents. Um, you know, Jason Bean is really shown his worth um coming in as the backup to Jalen Daniels even though we saw some of Jason Bean last season um and he had his shining moments um at certain points but uh Devin Neal um is is a scary guy I mean he really is um he's someone that just has this dynamic play ability um to gain yards and um uh, there have been certain situations this season where we've been playing against a, a running back like that. And um, I, the thing with the running game is you can extend drives with the running game and take the number of possessions out of this whole deal. And if we're in a situation where their running game is really working and we're not getting the number of possessions in this game that we would like to see when this gets close in the fourth quarter, that's the thing that, that does scare me um, of how they're going to scheme against our defense. Um, you know, obviously Jason Bean has shown some great things passing. If he doesn't play, then that takes that dynamic piece out of it too. Um, but I would say, I mean, I, offensively, they're a great offensive team. If you think about it, I mean, they're 17th in the country, 18th in the country in efficiency. They're one spot behind us. So if we think about how good our, fen- our offense has been this season, KU is just behind that. Um, so this game, I don't think will necessarily be a shootout, but I think they're going to figure out a way to to take advantage of those possessions and try and find some points. So that's what that's what scares me. You obviously have to go to their offensive scheme. I mean, it's just you know it's unique. It's things that you don't see every day. It's not a triple option per se, but they definitely run some veers and some they run some triple option out of like a pistol set or whatever. So it is a unique offense that. You have to game plan, and on a week's notice, it is a little tough, you know, to have that in your in your repertoire for a defensive for a defensive game plan. But for me, what I would say is what KU has done good uh, defensively is they they create turnovers and they score off of turnovers. They might not be statistically one of the best defenses, but when you know. Kobe Bryant, uh, Colby Bryant, is it Co- Kobe? Is it's it Kobe? Kobe? It's spelled C O B E E, I think, but it's yeah. Kobe. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So when, when he gets his hands on the ball or, you know, they get, they get to the quarterback or whatever, they get the ball in their hands and they're usually going to score. So those are aspects of the game that, you know, can flip games and make it tough to win them on the road. If, a quarterback decides, hey, I want to turn it over two times, and one of them's a pick six. You know, those are game flippers. So those are things that I'm looking for. But I think we're in a situation where we can take care of the ball by running it and uh, be efficient in the offensive passing game to, you know, eliminate those mistakes. So those are what I'm looking for, but that is what, what scares me for KU's defense. I think for me, offensively, the things that scare me the most are, are Devin Neal and, and Daniel Highshaw because in games where we've lost in conference play, it's come when you've got a running back who has 100-plus yards against this defense. And this defense has been a good rushing defense, but when they're when they're leaking and, and you get a Jonathan Brooks or an Ollie Gordon who can get 100-plus yards on you, that doesn't typically bode well for K-State in, in those situations. So that's that's what I'm probably most concerned about. I think the secondary has proven over the last few games that they've they've done a much better job of defending on the pass and 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 getting some of those pass breakups. We see Marquis Siegel get those pass breakups. We've seen guys like like Keenan Garber had the had the pick six in that last game against Baylor. So 
I think the secondary is turned up in a way that at the beginning of the season, I don't think we knew what we had with the secondary, but I, I feel a lot more solid about where things are at now. Um, but so I think if KU is going to get a victory here, the thing that scares me the most is certainly their rushing attack. And, and if, our, if we can do what we've done against the teams that we've beaten in conference play, I think the team will be fine. But if they can get 100 plus yards on us rushing, that's what's going to scare me. And it's going to be a lot closer than, than people probably think it might be. And it's similar to what we're going, what we were going into versus Oklahoma State, you know, yeah. back to a back to a freshman middle linebacker. You know, we're a little dinged up at the linebacker spot, uh, banged up at the defensive tackle spot. It's Uso. And then who's our second string? Cooper Beebe. <laughs> he did a, a two-way player for the Heisman. It could happen. And Charles Woodson did it. So let, let Cooper Beebe eat. Uh, man, it's, it's going to be tough because, you know, we're going to rely on a freshman middle linebacker to go up against two strong running backs. Like you said, Bob, it's, it's something that does it does concern you, but I think all around, I think new emerging players. You you brought up Keenan Garber. He he's got his hands on his first ball, his first touchdown as a K State Wildcat. And who would have thought it would have been on the defensive side when he we recruited him out of Lawrence? Rex uh, Van Wy had a had a good yes. game against Baylor as well, and and he's in that linebacking position where that's that's a position of need right now as far as depth is concerned. And what what we're hearing is that. You know, if it comes down to it, Rex Van Wy can play that will and Austin Moore can, you know, slide inside and play Mike. So because Moore will be the play caller on defense with. Yes, you know, exactly. So it's it's going to be it's going to be interesting what we're going to see defensively from us. But I think all in all, I think we are and we haven't gotten news about Jake Clifton yet, but it did not look great. So, you know. I'm I'm expecting him to be out, but you know, Khalid Duke, he'll be back. <laughs> we didn't see him basically for the yeah. entire game, so I think our de our defensive line has stepped up, and our D yes, yeah, Wildcat Country. Let's fuck. He's he was out there doing it. He was letting that Wildcat Country ride. You know, DBs solid, D defensive line solid. It was just and the emergence of C Cody Stuffelby. Yeah, I mean we're deep. But we're we're a little banged up at the linebacker spot, so that is a concern against these good running backs for KU. And and I guess the last thing I'll say is, K State is notorious for having a ton of Kansas kids. Kansas is notorious for not recruiting as many Kansas kids. Granted, Devin Neal, their their running back, is a Kansas kid. He was on our list. We offered him. It came down to the wire with him, and and he ended up going KU. But. Kansas kids will always get up for this matchup because it means so much more to those of us who did grow up in the state and, and know what this rivalry means because I'll, ne I'll never fucking forget. I want to say it was the 2007 game and there was a 2007, we lost to them and we had, we had a good team that year with Josh Freeman and Jordy Nelson. And unfortunately ended up not, not quite going the way that, that I think we could have probably gone that season with the talent that we had and that's just Ron Prince squandering some of that talent and, and being an absolute sociopath. But I'll never forget when I was in the lunchroom at school and this kid had created a cardboard sign that he was wearing around the lunchroom that had the final score of the game on it. And I'm like, bitch, you haven't even fucking won this game. Like in, in the entirety of your lifetime, why are you, why are you bragging about this? And what dude, a nerd. Dude, it drove me, but it drove me crazy. And and yeah, they've only gotten, I think, five wins in my lifetime in this football matchup. But the wins that they get, they they sting and they hurt and they hit me hard. And I never want to feel that feeling again that I felt in the lunchroom in middle school. But yeah, I, I, I hate KU. I respect their team. I respect Lance Leipold for the job that he's done there. And I respect a lot of the talent and, and seeing guys like Devin Neal, I, I wish him all the success in the world, especially him being a Kansas guy. But we have more Kansas guys and those guys, Cody Stuffelby, Keenan Garber, Cooper Beebe, those guys are going to get up for this matchup and they're going to want to beat the piss out of that Lawrence team in Lawrence, the Jayhawks team in Lawrence. But this this matchup means a lot more than, than games against Iowa State, than games against Oklahoma State, because it just there's a reason why they protected this rivalry for four more years. Do you have any lunchroom bully stories, Matt? 
not about the K-State KU football game. <laughs> nobody <laughs> knew that. Nobody knew what K-State and Kansas what about the SUNY was. Albany versus SUNY I, whatever. <laughs> no, SUNY Albany and Siena. Now that's a that is oh. a crosstown basketball rivalry if I've ever heard one. Go Saints. Go Saints. Oh, um Saints. Yeah. Siena, uh, probably. Siena. Siena. Yeah. Saints yeah. when the Saints go marching in, Chef. Yeah, I was just about to say that. <laughs> you stole it from me. I it's, that's her fight. I don't song. know. I don't know how Matt feels so nervous about this game. I just don't get it. You know, it's it's set up perfectly for us. And and especially especially now, I don't I think this team is so focused because we're back in the we're back in the Big 12 title race. We're back in it. That's why, Chef. Everybody you, the th- the thing that is so annoying this week, and we're gonna talk about this later, is we're talking Big 12 championship scenarios. We need to guess what? It doesn't fucking matter unless you win the next few games. It doesn't. But look, but look, there was oh, a okay. situation last year though, too. We yeah. had I, that matchup last year, and I was more nervous probably for that matchup than I am this year, primarily because of the quarterback situation with KU, because they had Jalen Daniels back at that point. Yeah, I mean the the player the the players we don't they don't think about this shit like we do. They're not sitting on Twitter like, oh, let's look at all the different. Unless you're you know, in it after the Texas game, saying, well, <laughs> you know, well, he's looking for that noise. He's looking for those bullies that were in your lunchroom teasing and stuff. We're he's looking for that. He, he was ain't just, worried. He was just reading Chef's Twitter timeline. Let's be honest. Never, never. He's pulling I, the receipts. Pulling the receipts. My receipts are clean, baby. The IRS is coming after me, and they're clean. They are clean. You're muted, Matt. You can't find nothing on me. Yeah, these are fighting words right now. <laughs> these are fighting words. Any any final thoughts on the KU game before we get to predictions and recipes for success and any of that? Because I have one one more question I want to ask the two of you before we get got, into that. I got one. Special teams. How are we feeling? Because the Baylor game was not our best showing. Uh, you know, two long ass punt returns, long ass ones, and then the, there was a kick return that was close, and then a, a fake field goal, which was, I mean, the most obvious thing I've ever seen in my life. I think that, and I think the coaches knew it, and the players knew it too. It's just they didn't know exactly what they were going to do because the defense was out there. It was the defense that was on that kick block or whatever but i mean what do you what do we think of special teams because tenant rebounded yeah he was perfect he was perfect uh and kick return looks solid uh with treshawn ward actually taking a couple he took one almost 40 he almost broke it to the house if it won for one player i mean how are we feeling i don't know how ku special teams are this year i haven't looked at it well, Sean well, Snyder is on the KU staff right now. So and he's talking to the team. He's talking. Oh, yeah. He's talking to the team about how meaningful this matchup is as a first year coach at KU. Okay, cool. <laughs> he has he has no history on it from the other side. I mean, it, it's just kind of it would be that would be weird to me if I were if he, listening to a coach talking about how one sided it was. I wonder if he like went into like auto K state and accidentally slipped like uh, K state where we've got to do this thing. And then, you know, just like, <laughs> oh, he is a robot. He could have just malfunctioned for all we know. Oh, poor God. Conspiracy but, theory. The I Snyders mean, are fake. Special teams wise. One of the things I, I am most keen on looking at in these games has been Chris Tennant and seeing if he's solid from, from, you know, kicking field goals at extra points. And, and he was a hundred percent and, and really, he slipped up in that Texas game with that, what, 28 yarder. But outside of that, he's looked pretty solid most of this season. I, I feel like he's got his mind in the right spot. When we're looking at the returns and stuff, I'm, I'm definitely at least encouraged by the fact that that we're returning things longer than we were before. I, I kind of like seeing Treshawn Ward back there returning kicks as opposed to a guy like Phillip Brooks or Keegan Johnson. But um, yeah, I, I, I feel better about it than I did maybe game one or game two, just, just knowing that we didn't quite know what we had. I just don't know that we're ever going to go back to the special teams you moniker and and have those, you know, we're going to house or we're, we're going to have an opportunity to house a kick every game. I just don't see that right now. And, and, and it doesn't 
feel like they've maybe put the emphasis on it that Snyder put on it. So doing what we've been doing is fine with me. I'm, I'm fine with it. I love seeing guys like Toby O doing what he did in that last game against Baylor, where that dude is a freak athlete. We need to find whatever ways that we can to get him involved in the game plan. And if that's on special teams right now, then fucking go for it because that dude, that dude lit up the Baylor returner. And that was, that was fun to watch. He's the fastest guy on the team. I mean, we, we have to get him involved. So I'm, I'm fine with where special teams are at. That's, that's kind of where I'm at. Yeah. We had a part where we had a block, like, what, what it wasn't really. It wasn't really a block. I mean, the no, I dude. Know, I know. The dude He's threw it three feet it. behind. I, pick, I, I know. On the fake or whatever. No. Uh. I. I mean. It. I, it's very evident where the special teams phase of the game is like not our strongest compared to every other year. So we're noticing it more this season because we've had so much success in consecutive seasons for this. Um, this would be the first season we hadn't had a punt return touchdown or a kick return touchdown, right? We haven't had in a one. long time. Yeah, in, in a, a long, long time. time. I, mean, I mean, the Baylor game that was our first, you know, first non-offensive touchdown all season. Yeah, and you know that would be if it, it ended today. This would be our lowest in like 20, 25 years. Yeah. So it's just a different. It's a different mindset that we now have on it. So yeah, I think the rules set it up that it has to be that way, but I think. Going into this game specifically, I it could be a factor. You know, I think I don't know what the weather is going to be like. We said it was going to be one of the most beautiful days for Fort Riley Day, and it was just like it's a eh, all right day, kind of cold, kind of rained. Yeah, rained before the game. So. Sunny apparently in Lawrence, Lawrence, Kansas. LFK. The sun does rise in Lawrence, Kansas. <laughs> you would you would wear a blue and red hat, you fucking traitor. Oh, no, it's pink. It's pink. Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Oh, that was last month. Yeah, you're way off. Yeah. Come on. Okay. Buy or sell. We'll do Mm. this like around the horn style. Buy or sell. Will Howard ties the single season touchdown record against KU. He has 21 currently. He would need 24 total. That's. It's only 24. It's only 24. The. Total record was season, only 44. <laughs> single season passing touchdown record for K State is didn't 24. Joe didn't Joe Burrow oh, no, have like 60 touchdowns the one year he played at LSU and won we national talked about this at the beginning of the season. L. Roberson has the record. It was set in 2003, and I mean he's already he's in fourth place. Okay, do I think he could get it in this game? You said tie, tie it. Tie or break? Three touchdowns. No, four touchdowns. Three touchdowns. Three, three to tie, four to break. I'm gonna and say he didn't, he didn't even start the Texas Tech game. I'm gonna say Great sell. This. I'm gonna say sell. Um because okay. I as much as K like K's defense is not great. Um I think we're gonna we're gonna run the ball pretty well. Um mm-hmm. and DJ and Trey Sean will get their time. Um so I'm gonna say he only has two touch passing touchdowns in this game. So I'm going to say sell. Yeah, I'm going to sell it as well. I think DJ and Trayshawn are going to get theirs. I think he, I think, God, Matt, you are a bald knower. I'm going to say it too as well. Bald God, knower, that's... you asshole. <laughs> <laughs> no, ball knower. You, you know, ball. Uh, yeah, I'm going to sell. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's one more game versus Iowa State at home. He puts the, they give him a, uh, a, Autograph ball from L. Roberson to say, hey, blowing kiss to the fans. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, of roses at the end of the game. Oh, I would like to know how close he, what's the, I mean, obviously that's Colin Klein, right? The just for all purpose, like running and throwing oh, total. Yeah. Um, it's got to be 40 something. Or maybe not 30. 30 has Colin, he had 20? Colin Klein had 27 rushing touchdowns in 2011 and 23 in 2012. And he leads all players in single season rushing touchdowns, regardless of position. So what would, what, I mean, where's Will Howard on single season touchdowns all like all purpose? Cause you know, throwing and throwing and catching. I don't know that I, I don't mean, throw, know. 
because he's got one catching too this season. So total oh, offense. Touche. total offense. Colin Klein had forty in a single season. Yeah, where is he at right now? You know, he's if got only... twenty one passing, one catching, and like <laughs> true. <five. laughs> And co- 10 out of Colin Klein's rushing touchdowns were inside the two yard line. So it's incredible yeah. how we don't, under, he has, we don't do that anymore for anything. He has 28 between passing and rushing. And that would, I mean, he would have one as a receiving that's not listed here. 29. So 20, so, 29. So he's not getting to, he's not getting no. 11 more TDs. No. No, I mean Jalen Milrow put up six last last game for Bama, so I mean it's not impossible. Yeah, it's not impossible. It is not impossible. Could you imagine <laughs> if he went three rushing, three passing the next two game and broke it? That'd be nuts. <laughs> that would be nuts. That'd be fun. I'd take that'd, it. That'd be so fun. That'd be fantastic. Not happen. No. No, nah, it ain't gonna happen. So. Give me a give me another buy or sell. So you're selling, you're selling. I would love to do another buy or sell, but we've got Fireball Matt's burn it down moment of the week. Do you have one from last week or or no? Well, we mentioned the 70 yard punt, and then they drove down the field in three minutes and scored against us in the first quarter. But that was really the worst like part of that game. I thought it might have been a ball game when they did that too, because they. they I started. thought so too, because they. I. What? I said I usually don't text during games, but I had to say something for that one because that oh, yeah, one was like. I was like, yo, that one was rough. Like, what the fuck are we doing? <laughs> uh, I would probably, I'll put the uh, punt return because out of that entire game, you think about how we just killed their soul. They uh, popped up out of the the dirt to do a 70 yard punt and then they didn't score anything out of it, right? Or did they? I don't remember. I don't know, but they were. They were I erased that game. Oh, the on, onside were kick, too. And bruised. Oh, they did get the, that stupid onside kick, which I like. What the fuck are we thinking? So special teams buying or selling? <laughs> yeah, sell. <Yeah. laughs> but this could be the game where like Trey Sean breaks one off or Philip Bricks breaks one off, and everybody's like, "Oh yeah, the special teams are great." Totally, that'd be dirty. Totally. I'd love that. Chef, what's your recipe for success this weekend? Man, it's it's one of those games. It's one of those games where everything's on the line. You know, you go, you have some of those dinner services where you know that there's a big party coming in and you, and it's a, probably like some high maintenance Karen type lady that you just have to take care of. They're, they're prissy, all this stuff. That's kind of the situation that we're in. We're, we're threading this, you know, big 12 championship reappearance very thinly. You know, we've got to shoot this one straight. and. We have to be on our – we have to do everything perfectly. And I think this team is built where we can. We've, we, we're have we senior-laden. We, we've we gone through it before this previous season. So we've seen this dinner service before. We've dealt with this Karen before. Can we do it again in Lawrence? I think we can, man. I think we're going to put up one of those services where she can't even complain. And – K K State's gonna come out with that victory, baby. I'm so excited. Dude. So so who's the Karen in this analogy? Like if you uh, had KU's the Karen. But but is it like Lance Leipold specifically, or is it Andy Cuddlenecky? I think Lance Leipold has a, potentially Lance Leipold has a Karen laugh. So I would say I would say Lance Leipold is the Karen that's trying to, you know. He, He has he has a what laugh? He has a Karen laugh. He laughs That's in funny. reverse. That was that was the thing that was funniest to me when when that clip first showed up. I I want to say it was special teams. You replied to it and said, "Why is Bro laughing in reverse?" He sounds like Boomhauer from King of the Hill. It's tough. It's bad. <laughs> so he's the Karen in this situation, and the dinner service is us trying to thread our way back to the Big 12 title through all these tiebreaker situations. And you're not in a tiebreaker situation if you don't win the games. Right. So let's let's get some dubs, baby. Final score predictions. Let's go around the horn. I'll start with Matt this time. 
Oh no. Let's rip the band-aid. I'm just ripping it off. Um, I think we lay a duck in this game and we lose 31 to 27. I'm sorry. I hope Jesus this is Christ. I hope I hope this is a uh like a I don't know. I don't know. I just I don't know. I have a feeling. It's gonna be close. What's... Everybody's gonna murder me after saying this, but look, I have to be honest. I have an opinion. All opinions matter, even if they're shitty. That is a real shit opinion. The shit opinion, and I I'm going on the record saying that I got the score thirty eight. Can I have two scores depending on quarterback situation? No, no. One score. I I got one score no matter what. If Cole Ballard plays, it's thirty eight to ten K State. There you go. All right, I got it. Thirty eight twenty one K State. All right. I've got 33, 28 cats. Again, that was assuming that was assuming a Jason Bean might be playing there, but I think it's a close one. I think it's a close one. KU's going to get up for this one. They're going to have a better crowd than they've had in years at the David Booth Memorial Stadium. I just I, I feel good about the matchup, but I don't feel overly confident about it because I agree with Matt as well that we haven't played four full quarters away. <laughs> I don't I don't buy that. I just don't buy it, man. Doesn't mean you can't win the game. I still think we win the game. What it's four quarter much. what what four quarters didn't we play in Missouri? I mean, defensively we got smoked, but I don't think that's you know fourth quarter. Fourth quarter. We were right there. We had a lead in the fourth quarter and we did not execute on offense right. to get the first down. Like I mean, I'm just saying, like every game on the road, we have had at least one quarter. Where we didn't put it together, didn't put it together. That's that is what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. That, I'm that's not a football guy take, you know, because I mean, how <laughs> that's not a football guy take. Like, what what team has always executed every quarter, every game, road, home, every one of them? What team does that? I would argue that. In at least one of the three home games that we've just had, we executed in all four quarters of the game. Yeah. I don't know. I'm not saying you like <laughs> that execution is execution was absolutely executed in all four quarters. Execution is it could be. A I heard people complain about out. Will Howard in that game. Oh, well, that's because you've got fucking Tuscaloosa fan, K-State fan on, on the message board saying that, oh, you know, whatever, blah, blah, blah. It just doesn't work that way. I just, that's, you know what, as you just told me five minutes ago, I know ball. And now you're saying like. That take is just not a, a football guy take. I'm sorry, that, a, I'm sorry I, that Jar Jar Binks was upset that that Houston, <laughs> the Houston game wasn't a hundred percent perfectly flawless from from end to end. But and I'm not expecting just like, about as perfect as it could have been. I'm not expecting like I'm not saying a flawless game is you score every drive and you the other team goes three and out, but it's certain points in the game that where momentum can swing and it's how you execute based off that. That's how that is what I feel about that on a quarter to quarter basis. Okay. And there I, was I, no opportunity for Houston to capitalize on any kind of momentum change. Baylor could have done that if they if they went after it was seven to seven. If they had gotten a stop on defense, that could have been a ball game. But K State didn't let it happen. So they they capitalized on snuffing out any kind of momentum change that could have happened there. Well, hopefully we run a perfect game for a little Matt so we can. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Oh, oh, the bag's coming. Bag boy. Bag this is, boy. This is like the sad bag. Yeah, the, you deserve. What bag? He needs a like a bag with no eyes in it. This what? is. I like and I couldn't read the outline. <laughs> we can read it for you. You actually be, can't talk during this entire segment. That would be bad. That would be bad. I did get feedback that is that too loud? Yeah, it sounds like you're I got feedback that I couldn't be heard through the bag. As that's a guy fine. that's been in the bag a lot, you're fine. You gotta cut out the you gotta cut out a mouthhole though. 
Oh, fuck the mouthful. Each week, we share our lots for three Big 12 matchups, one national game of the week, and one sicko game. And last week was bad for me. I went 0-5, but it was bad for everybody. The other two guys went 2-3 and three each. It's a bad week across the board, but nothing can beat 0-5 because that's literally the worst you could possibly do. So I think everything can beat 0-5. Yep. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Season standings. Fireball Matt is in first with a 26-27-2 record overall. He's below 500. That sucks for him. Chef is in second with a 25-28-2 record, and I am in last with a 25-30 record overall. And with that, the winner of the week last week was neither of you. So one of you pick who wants to go first and just go for it. Rock, paper, scissors? We've got a rock, paper, scissors happening for those of you listening on the audio feed. And the victor be, is me. I'll be going first. Paper beats rock every time. Uh, let's go to these big 12 games. Let's who says yes. I'm, I'm doing this on the fly, by the way. Because that, that's always trended really well for you. So <laughs> no research whatsoever. <laughs> No, none needed. Why can I not find any Big 12 games? What Do you happening? want me to go first because I've done my due diligence? I mean, I, I guess I could go sicko game first if I have to. No, I'll go Big 12. We're here. We're here, baby. My first Big 12. It's These are the easiest locks of the year. It's the easiest ones. Iowa State plus seven and a half on Texas. This is... This is the dream scenario, and I think everything's lining up for it. Iowa State routed BYU in Provo. Just demolished them. They look tough. I, I am getting nervous about that game. The fighting Campbells, he's not up for any jobs this year, so he's just solely focused on them Longhorns. Michigan well, State. He's been mentioned in reference to Michigan State. Ah, no, no, they want Lance. They he want seems, Lance. He seems like an Aggie, actually. Okay. Okay, now you guys are just starting rumors. That's sick. You guys need to stop that. Okay, I got Iowa State plus seven and a half at home on Big Boy Fox. Then, I mean, UCF. Have they found something? John Rice Plumley, he's been kind of he's kind of banging on doors. He's trying to find something. Texas Tech, maybe that was their Super Bowl versus KU. Ew. Back home, Texas Tech. I'm going to take UCF plus two and a half. Plus two and a half. And then my third Big 12 game. God, 24 and a half. That's so many points on the road. But I'm taking them. Minus 24 and a half. OU. Let's go, baby. They're going to stomp BYU. Those Mormons are on mission. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> this moments are on mission. <laughs> oh my, my god. <laughs> my oh, yeah. my national game of the week, Tennessee at home after a letdown versus those Missouri Tigers. I'm gonna take plus 10 and a half versus Georgia. They're not worried about Tennessee right now, but they need to be. Knoxville's going to be bumping. They're going to have that all checkerboarded out. Give me, give me those uh, volunteers volunteering 10 and a half points. No, actually, it's the opposite way. They're getting 10 and a half points. Give me those points. Against Georgia? They're playing Georgia this weekend? Yeah. Ooh, that's yeah. going to be good. Yeah. Two versus, well, I don't know what Tennessee is going to be after that loss, but give me that game. And then my sicko game, Colorado State in Nevada. Who that Nevada team took this KU team down to the wire, but they're in Fort Collins. Yeah, Fort Collins minus 10 or 11. Minus 11. Give me Colorado State. This I love the sexiest helmets are, are the Ram horns on helmets, those are absolutely dirty. Love the even though the Rams, the Los Angeles Rams, fucked them up putting that line in between them. Terrible. Give me Colorado State minus 11. Wow. All right. Uh, on my side of the ball, Big Twat, you know, Chef isn't even giving me the respect to even listen to my locks. 
Um, all right, Big 12. Uh, West Virginia, six and a half point favorite, uh, hosting Cincinnati, who is not very good. Um, so I am going West Virginia on that one. Oklahoma State at Houston. Now, Oklahoma State's a seven point favorite. I think this game is going to be close, but I don't think it's going to be like a three point or Houston victory. Um, thinking maybe Oklahoma State seven to 10 point win. I'm taking Oklahoma State. And then Iowa State hosting Texas. I believe Iowa State's going to have some magic this weekend, and they're going to upset the Texas Longhorns and Ames. Um, that could be good for us if we win the next two games. So I'm going to Iowa State covering eight against Texas. My national game of the week, Arizona and Utah, two ranked teams coming to the Big 12. Arizona on a pretty good run right now in the Pac-12. They're five and three in conference, seven and three overall. Utah, seven and three, four and three in conference. Arizona hosting Utah. I'm Arizona's a one-point favorite in that game. I think Arizona is going to beat up on Utah. And then my sicko game of the week, going back to the Big Ten, Northwestern, kind of on a little bit of a tear after they fired their coach for a good reason. Um, Purdue, not great right now. I think Northwestern's going to go. They're going to get a dub at home. They are one-and-a-half-point dogs against Purdue. Northwestern wins the game. Wow. Wow. Love that. Well, I've got my locks now, but you probably shouldn't follow them because I went 0 for 5 last week. But for the Big 12. Fade, got, fade, the, fade Bob's picks. Fade Bob's picks. Fade Bob's picks. So I have the West Virginia Mountaineers minus 6.5 versus Cincinnati, who sucks. I don't care that they just got to win this past weekend. They suck. They're horrible. And their, their chili is dog shit. Horrible, horrible chili. Dog shit chili. So I'm going with West Virginia. Go Mountaineers. Let's go Mountaineers. TCU minus 12 and a half versus Baylor in the rivalry. I guess they're trying to rebrand this rivalry to the Blue Bonnet Bowl or something. Stupid. Stick with the name. Stick with the name. You can't just change the name of your rivalry after playing it for 110 years or whatever they've done. TCU by a million. I'm taking Texas Tech minus two and a half versus UCF. UCF is going to be hangover, hangover central. Their board shorts with the side of regret is coming back to haunt them. Texas Tech gets a big victory. They're right. They're riding high. They're rolling off of a big win against the Hawks. Give me Raider, Raider Nation. National game of the week. I'm going with the Washington Huskies plus one and a half at Oregon State. Washington, they looked a little sus last week, but they are still in the college football playoff picture. They're going to beat the Beavers. Go Huskies. Go Huskies. My sicko game, I've got the Iowa Hawkeyes. They're undefeated since they fired Brian Ferentz, by the way, and they scored 22 points and shut out Rutgers last week which if you would have listened to my locks last week, you would have picked Rutgers, which was the wrong side of this one. So I'm going to get my mind right. I'm going to pick the Iowa Hawkeyes. I think they're going to beat Illinois by more than three and a half points. So let's go Hawkeyes. Will there well, be more than three and a half points? That's what I was going to say. <laughs> there were 22 last week, baby. 22. <laughs> they and still hit the under on that record low line of 27 and a half. Yeah, we need to get Russell Buchanan back on here to talk about and Brian Ferentz getting let go at the end of the season. Mm. Russell yeah, for Iowa. That was, that was pretty Could tough. you imagine just knowing that you're going to a football game every week and your offense isn't going to score like more than two touchdowns? Did you see that video of the, us? Did you see that video of the uh, the Iowa versus, I want to say it was like Illinois game, and they put it like the old-timey filter, so it looked like a 1920s football game with the music in the background? That was absolutely classic. Just, you know. Was the music like... Dun, 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 basically. <laughs> basically old circus music. Yeah. Dude, my, my favorite thing during the Brian Ferentz saga was the, the climb for 325 or whatever. 
and I think it was Reddit CFB that was putting it out every week or Sicko's committee, one of the two. And they, they had the prices right music for like, if you win something on the prices, right. Or if you lose something on the prices, right. It was more often than not that it was the like want want type of music, but it was just kind of, I don't know. It was just funny. It was just funny. Hmm. Funny is up to the imagination, right? Sure. Sure. It is. Well, boys, do we want to talk a little bit about the hoops games that we've gotten to watch so far? Granted, we're, we're recording this on Tuesday night or Tuesday night, Monday night, and we just played South Dakota State. None of the three of us got a chance to watch much of that game, but we do have two other games that that we've got under the under our belts with the USC game and the Bellarmine game. And we haven't had a chance to talk hoops at all since we've started playing regular season action. So I guess I'm just curious so far. I, I know, Chef, you have thoughts on what you've liked, what you've not liked, who's impressed you, who's not impressed you so far. But I want to hear from you, you too, Matt, just because I haven't had a chance to talk to you about it much at all. But what are you thinking so far about this hoops team, knowing that we also don't have Naquan Tomlin playing right now and Arthur Kaluma is in, injured? Uh, minor knee minor, in. minor knee injury per Jerome Tang. One of the one of the and he did he, he did not practice and he felt that he shouldn't play if he was not able to practice because of an injury. Mm, that Just buy in you got to buy into practice. Ball ball knower, ball true ball knower. You know for this basketball team, you know Matt is the basketball guy on the squad. He he knows a lot about basketball, but from my bird's eye view, watching this team, it we have talent. We're going to be relying reliant on a lot of you know hot shooting nights i think i have seen a concerted effort for rebounding and hustle this season so far even in the the usc game especially that first half you saw the energy it was palpable it was there it was oozing through the screen we couldn't shoot to save our lives but we had the hustle and if we're able to throw that into almost every game. I don't know if that's sustainable, that hustle every game, but if we have that kind of fight and energy in our bag, I think we'll be able to stay in a lot of games. Shooting wise, if we do have really good shooters on this team, you know, when Cam, you know, when Cam is throwing them in the bucket, Tyler Perry, from what we've seen outside of the USC game, he is a very, very good shooter. I don't know what his season stats are right now, but from from the Bellarmine game and the South Dakota State game, I think he's he's really really consistent from the three point line and just shooting in general. And then you throw in Arthur Kaluma if he is able to go full effort, full tilt, and be that glue guy until maybe Naquan comes back. We don't know about that situation. Uh, but if the, if those guys, those core guys, those four guys that I just mentioned, including Naquan can bring it on the, the energy side and have moderately to above average shooting, we're going to be a dangerous team. We, we have the depth, we have the big, we have bigs that are willing to foul, willing to get on the boards and do things. So I'm excited for this basketball team two and one. I mean, did we really think we were going to beat USC? I mean, maybe before the season, before the Naquan news, maybe, but going into that, that game, I knew we were, I had a itching that we were going to lose. I had an inkling that we were going to lose that game. So they're right where I thought they needed to be. They, they, and they kept it a ball game for a good chunk of the game, too. It, it, it was well into the second half before it really got out of hand without Naquan. I, I feel like if Naquan is in that game, it really comes down to the wire. Maybe it's a last shot situation. And, and I like what you said, too, about the effort. Like You're really seeing both defensively and offensively. I think it was during the USC game I tweeted that Jarrell Colbert, if it's, if it's the play hard chart and that's still a thing, Jarrell Colbert is, is winning tons of points on the play hard chart during that game because he was, he was kind of all over the place, you know, going after, going after steals, going after blocks, like that dude blocking the ball is a freak athlete. That's so much fun to watch him uh, go up and, and try to not swat it away. It's so much fun to watch, but I man, think the, 
I Go think ahead. the defense could I'm, before Matt gets in there and you know oozes his ball knowledge all over us. Uh, I think the defense. <laughs> <laughs> I think the defense could be a little bit better. I don't know exactly if everybody knows their role. You know, it's just that the no middle defense really does put it to it, the name to the test. And, you know, there is sometimes no defense in the middle at all. So it it could be better, but it's still early. So drop that ball of knowledge, baby. Don't you Ooh, don't ball. you dare say it. Um yeah, I I thought the USC game was going to go a little bit differently, um, but after seeing USC in that game, and I've seen some of the highlights of their their last couple games, or at least they they played a low major team on a Thursday night. That team's going to be right under Arizona for the Pac-12 this season. Um, they have a guy who's going to be a, potentially a lottery pick, um, Boogie Ellis, the other. Um, guard. I mean, he went off against us. They have a backcourt that is really going to challenge a lot of teams this season. Um, and without, if we had Naquan Tomlin in that game, I don't think we were going to win that game. Um, I just, I, I don't. Uh, the, the Bellarmine game was, I, in a lot of ways, I felt we controlled that game. Um, they got a little bit loose in the second quarter, or excuse me, the second half. Um, but that game and then tonight, we're seeing Cam Carter. He's turning into an elite, elite player for us. Um, he's obviously shooting the ball very well. Um, you know, he's scoring at a good clip. But defensively, he just looks so good defensively. Um, and it's kind of, at least in these past two games, it's turned into a little bit of a lockdown defender. Um, and especially as you get towards Big 12 play, you have to have – guys that are going to stop these guards and cam is really shown early on that, that, that there's capability there and that he could be the, everybody's been talking about Tyler Perry, you know, best shooter in America. We're going to hear that going through and he showed that tonight. There's no question about it, but cam Carter is really showing that he has the capability to score in a lot of different facets of this game. Um, and he's going to be, I, I think potentially the star for us this season, which you think he averaged seven points a game last season. He's developed into a really great player. Um, it has been the big men. Um, I know I've told you guys, I've said it on Twitter, um, with the offense that Jerome Tang's trying to put out there, having David Gasson at the four is, I, I think, a big stretch. Um, and uh, he's not showing great ability to shoot the basketball. Um, he had a great night rebounding tonight. I think he went eight rebounds tonight with six points. Um, which we know, you know, he's shown the ability to rebound the basketball. Um, it will be interesting to see with Naquan Tomlin coming back, how this is all going to fit. Um, because Will McNair has, has definitely shown, I, I, I did not expect him to really kind of show some of the stuff that we've seen this season, um, being a late guy that we've brought in, but I mean, he's showing to be very much a manageable, manageable guy that's going to rebound, um, he'll get some easy bunnies in there and have at a high percentage. Uh, but he's gonna he's gonna pick up some fouls too um, that we've seen. Um, Jarrell Colbert's shown some stuff, and then of course the freshman. I mean, uh, like Day Day is going to be thrust here into Big Twelve play, and he's going to be a guy that is potentially going to be starting as a true freshman against some really high caliber caliber guards in the Big Twelve, and he's shown the ability to to create some stuff and make shots. RJ's has looked good. This playing time they're getting with Naquan out, Keith Glover out, and then Kalum out tonight is going to be huge for Big 12 play. Um, I think that bench is going to really provide some spark. Um, you're going to get some young guys out there who have capability to make shots. Um, I think the defensive part is going to be a little bit of a struggle, um, especially with some of these younger guys. But I, I have optimism with this team. Um, I we Last season, you know, I, we had that terrible loss at Butler. Uh, it, this team kind of looked out of sorts in non-conference play. I mean, we got to the the tournament, um, which looking back, that tournament we won last year was those teams were not great in that tournament. But uh, <clears throat> this upcoming week with Providence and potentially Miami, Providence is going to be – they have a new coach in Kim English. A lot of people in K-State fandom know who King Kim English was. He was a great player at Missouri. 
Um, he's leading that program this season. They're going to be a hard fought team to try and beat. And then if you are able to get by Providence, you're going to be playing Miami who has, I think the second or third best backed court in the country with Wooga Poplar, Nigel Pack. So we're going to get I, the, the USC game. You could consider it a test. The Miami game, it, you, I think you're playing a better team than USC. And so you're going to have to find ways to, to make baskets. If you shoot anywhere close to the USC game, it's going to be lights out in that game. If we got to that point, if we shoot like that versus anybody, we're going to, we're definitely not going to win. Correct. Uh, I, I will say this, that, that Miami team, you know, went against arguably the worst team in the big 12 on their home court in UCF. And it was a battle. Uh, I don't know yeah. if that says more about UCF than it does Miami, but it is a one game off and it is a one game test against a team that we will play that we would assume that we are going to be favorites over. Um, so, I mean, Miami does show, you know, growing, growing pains as well. The schedule Providence. I mean, it's just down the road. It's, it's going to be, it's going to be a test. And I, I, a lot of people are talking about the the schedule that we put together if it was too much for this team and how we're scheduling now under Jerome Tang. I, I like it a lot. I like premier matchups. I like games that actually matter this early in the season. But I wanted to I wanted to pose a question before we probably get out of here. How do you I mean last year was an exemplary team led by Marquise Noel. Probably the, you know, one of the most uh, true leaders that we've ever had at K-State in any sport. I mean, he was the build of a leader. This year, we don't have that leader and how Jerome is Tang has talked about this team and the, you know, buy-ins and suspensions and all this stuff. Still does accepting it, applications for leadership. Like yes. Does that worry you? Is that something that you think can get fixed I mean, is that a long-term issue that you feel like we're going to have? Because it doesn't seem – usually that's an off-season thing. That's not a two weeks into the season kind of thing that we're talking about for a basketball team. I think it it's a little bit different last season because Marquise Noel was one of two players that stayed. Um, and I'm sure on his from his perspective, he felt ownership in the team because he decided to stay. Um, so if you kind of look at it this way, could it be Cam Carter? I mean, could he be the, the, the guy who is the leader or you go with a guy like Tyler Perry, who has been a leader and is the oldest guy on the team, I believe might be second oldest. Cause I feel like McNair's also pretty old, but anyway, could it be a guy like Tyler Perry who, um, you know, is going to be just has experience. So I, I wouldn't necessarily say it concerns me because I think last year was such an outlier in how a, the construction of a program should be. And it worked out because you found excellent fits. Uh, the thing that maybe is a little bit more of a struggle this season is the, the fits that we deemed to be what we would see out on the outside as fits haven't fit yet. Like Kaluma hasn't fit yet. He's obviously talented, but without Naquan Tomlin, is that the reason why Kaluma isn't a fit right now? Because that, that Keith Glover being out and Tomlin being out, I'll say this, like Jerome Tang and his coaching staff had a, a way they were constructing the offense and defense on this team, and it was including these players. And I think Keith Glover was a little bit of a, a – was a bigger loss than people probably thought because he was going to get some good time. Maybe he was going to be a Desi Sills of this team, six-man – or maybe he was going to be starting at point. Who knows? But this team, I, I, the way that I'm seeing it right now is you're just trying to find the best lineup that fits the fits what personnel you have right now. Um, and tonight we saw like you could arguably you have the third and fourth most talented players not playing tonight whatsoever. And you beat a team that is projected to win their conference and go to the NCAA tournament. I mean, South Dakota state has been a very good team and you beat them by 20 something points. Um, that's a, that's a good win. That is a good win that shows that improvements have been, 
there's improvements since USC and the Bellerman game that make you think, okay, this team can go travel in a tournament and potentially win it. Who knows? That's a game that Bruce Weber might drop with this roster in non-conference in non-conference play five years ago. Yeah, that's a game that he could drop, or it's like a, it's it's a lot closer. Um, and so I, yeah, I mean, I think we all thought this game was going to be a lot closer tonight than it ended up being, um, based off of not having Arthur Kaluma. Um, I, I put obvi- money on this. I put money on that plus nine and a half for San Diego. I mean, yeah. South Dakota State. Yeah, yeah. the uh, other SD. Yeah, no, but no. I, I mean, I, I, th- I'm, I'm a lot more optimistic about this team just because it's obvious that the puzzle pieces haven't fully fit yet, and we're kind of making do with the personnel that are being put out there right now, and it's working, and it's working on a game to game basis, and I. You're just going to have guys coming off the bench that have to step up in these scenarios. Um, and if it's a freshman like Day Day or RJ Jones, that's huge. I mean, for us in Big 12, or Buddy play, Rich. Or Buddy Rich. Yeah. Um, so that's why I, I have optimism in this team. Um, I know when we talked basketball a while back, I thought we were going to lose one non conference game. Um, and albeit, I did say that game was going to be at LSU and not the USC game. And LSU kind of looks like a dumpster fire right now, uh, but <laughs> we shall we shall see, huh? And Villanova lost to, to Penn tonight, yeah. so yeah, yeah, a twenty twenty fourth or twenty fifth ranked Nova team just lost yeah. to, to Penn tonight. And again, we're recording this on a Monday, but I, I that that brings me to the last question before we get out: team ceiling and floor through these three games. Have, have after watching these three games, do you feel like that's changed for you? And what would you say the team ceiling and the team floor is this year, having watched these three games so far? I mean, I I think the ceiling is a they'll be top three in the Big Twelve. Whoa, with, I do, I do. The- um, I'm just look. I, you asked me what the ceiling is, right? You asked me what the ceiling is. I mean, I think the floor is a bubble team that just doesn't come together. Um, a team that'll go seven and 10 in conference and, you know, West Virginia made it in with seven and at seven and 10. That's my floor. Um, I, I think a more apt is like, uh, like fifth, um, fifth or sixth in the conference. Um, I, I think we're going to, the, the one piece as to why I'm saying this is we have done a really good job at creating or bringing back the atmosphere at home that where you can be in any game, no matter what other team you're playing, which is extremely helpful. Um, so if you're able to win your home games, I mean, that that's huge. So um, that's, I, I, I really do think the ceiling of this team is like a top three. Um, I think KU and Houston, and we're going to be up there with a Baylor Texas situation. Um, I think we're just off that. We're definitely just off that right now, but I think there's a lot of growth with this team. I do. And we saw last year how they developed into big 12 play. Um, and there's a lot of promise there. It's just this year, you're going to have maybe a little bit more of a freshman, uh, some of the freshmen having to pull some of the minutes that we saw last year from more experienced guys. For me, the, the ceiling with this team without Naquan, I think is fifth, sixth, in the Big 12. Uh the floor, I think I think this is an NIT team. The floor, you know, I think this is a, a strong NIT team. Uh, the the reason why I say that, and you brought up the West Virginia point from last year, I don't think we're gonna have nearly the quad one opportunities uh because you know we're not playing a are we we're playing an imbalanced schedule, ain't we? Like yeah, we're not playing. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't think we're going to have, you know, those road quad one losses and, the, you know, the the quad one wins at home because I think we got some UCFs in there. We've got some BYUs in there. It, it's going to it's going to hurt that. And I think you can't afford to have 10 losses in conference anymore. It's just, it's just I don't think that's going to be feasible. So. If, if Naquan comes back and he seamlessly finds his way into the lineup and, you know, this team 
grows and Kaluma finds his role, like you were just saying, Matt, with Naquan's return. Oh, man, with Naquan back, I mean, this team is this team is filthy. I think I think he's that integral to the team. I think he's he adds so much length and so much versatility for this offense that we're running because you said it perfectly. The coaches had a vision for how they built this team. And with the players that we have, it's not being able to run the way they want it to. So they're kind of gluing it together. So I don't think that's a top, you know, I don't think that's a top four team in the conference in a, a absolutely stellar conference. But I just think not being able to have those nine teams that you're going to be playing home and away, it's, it's just not going to work that way. So I think if you're, a seven and 10 team in this conference, you're, you're going to be probably on the outside. I think if you can minimize the damage while Quez Glover and Naquan Tomlin are out in the non-conference, because again, we don't know when Naquan's going to come back, but Quez Glover, he'll be back. At least projections are saying by the time conference play starts like a six to eight week injury. So hopefully knock on wood, he's back by conference play. But if you can minimize damage while those two guys are out as much as possible, you go into conference play. I think you can be, I wouldn't say top three. I would say maybe top four, top five in the big 12, just because I think Baylor's really good this year. And they're probably the third best team in the conference right now. And Texas is really fucking good this year too. So you're going to be battling it out. If, if it's a top three situation, you're going to be battling it out with Baylor and Texas who are stacked this year. Um, and I mean, I'm looking at Ken Palm right now, BYU and TCU are both ahead of us in Ken Palm right now through three games granted, but BYU is looking a lot better than people thought they would be at this point in the season. I don't know. It's, I, I don't think the floor is NIT. I think the floor is still bubble team that maybe doesn't figure it out. Like Matt was saying, but I, West Virginia dog shit, Oklahoma state dog shit, UCF dog shit. I mean, there's there is from what the conference was UCF last year. Seventy third right now in Ken Palm. I mean, from the where the conference was last year, there's some games on there that you can't slip up, or you're going to have a quad two loss or a quad three potentially. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I mean, uh, again, I'm looking at what I think the ceiling could be with Naquan Tomlin, um, and I do believe in I, with like, Naquan, we're dirty. Yeah, and I believe in Tyler Perry, and I believe in Cam's development and what he's done. Um, you know, Kaluma's the Kaluma's this this cog right now that he's just kind of in a little bit of a funk. It looks like. Um, I mean, I've seen his highlights. I mean, he's just and and I do think that with Tomlin and him in the lineup together, it changes a little bit of the dynamic of what you need Arthur Kaluma to be doing um, instead of being on the three point line, doing a predictable shot fake, trying to go inside and losing the ball. Cause it seems like that is what's occurring. Um, but I, I don't know. I'm excited for the season. The imbalance schedule changes it definitely a little bit. Um, and you're absolutely right. I mean, there's going to be some games that we're going to play this season that that could be a quad two loss on, on the road. And so that's, what's so important about the non-conference is um, winning your home games. And that includes a, a Villanova team that, you know, that's one of the big names outside of uh, the Big 12 that we've played at home in a very long time. I don't put Marquette in the same list as uh, Villanova. So, And USC, does, at that point, does that qualify as a quad two or a quad one loss because it was neutral site? Does neutral, that yeah, for yeah, sure. Because they're, they're top 25 team. So, yeah, they're um, 13th in Kempom right now. I mean, they're, yeah, they're good. Yeah. And they'll probably finish right around there, <laughs> not higher, too. Um West Virginia right now is the worst team in the Big 12, 87th in Ken Palm, but ahead of even Chris Beard's Mississippi team. Oklahoma, dog shit. <laughs> I mean, Texas Tech, I don't know what you're going to get with Texas Tech because they could be into this Big 12 where the defenses are really good and the offense that you could score the ball. So if, if Mc, Mc, what's his name, McCaslin, McCaslin. McCla McCaslin. McCaslin, if he doesn't figure out offense – they could be really dog shit too. They'll be in games, but they won't be able to finish. Ain't no way we're going to lose to Texas Tech this season knowing that we've got Jareem Dowling, who was on staff with Grant McCaslin, and Tyler Perry, who played four years for Grant McCaslin. We're not losing to that team. I mean, Jerome Tank coached with him too, so it's not like he doesn't know him either. So Yeah, this is not happening.
It is not happening. I, and there's a, I mean, it's just who's the other team that we brought in? Cincinnati, probably dog shit. They mm. are they are fifty second in Kempom. We're not going to truly know what teams are shit or dog shit until until right December thirty first. <laughs> other than West Virginia, does not look good right now. Losing that game to Monmouth. Uh, yeah, yeah. Best of luck I, to Josh Eilert or whatever his name is. Oh God, K State boy, K State boy. Well, for all of us at Cocaine Willie, thanks for listening to the show on your podcast feeds, watching us on YouTube. Do us a favor. If you're listening on Apple or Spotify podcast, leave us a five-star rating and follow the show. Give us a like on the video and subscribe to the channel. You can follow the show on Twitter or Instagram or follow us individually. I am at Bob Trollsby. Chef is at Chef Andre Napier. And Fireball Matt is at Matt Marchesini. Chef. Cocaine's a hell of a drug, man. It's just the worst. We are all coke and no joke. Wildcat country. <laughs>